this is that you don't need a corporate or a political title, an elected official's title to be a leader. You could be a leader in your community or someone. G'day, I'm Charlie, your online business manager and business coach. My goal is to assist small to medium business owners build their businesses with a focus on using the internet and online technologies in an appropriate and cost-effective manner. People hire me to take the stress out of managing their businesses and allow themselves to focus on what they do best. Welcome to my podcast. Today I have another guest, Ritu Chopra. I think I've said that correctly. She will correct me if I haven't. Uh, Ritu is a technologist by profession, an author, TV show host, award-winning film producer, and a certified leadership coach. She's a lot more than that. I'm not going to give you all of the spill here. I'm going to actually get, get Ritu to introduce herself to us. But Ritu, thank you so much for joining my podcast today. I am so pleased to be here. And um, thank you for warm welcome. And uh, so I am technologist by profession. Yes, quarter of a century in a corporate uh, IT world with the Fortune 500 companies. So I call myself um, a techie runaway filmmaker. So we'll get into that a little bit later. I never stepped in into any kind of filming school or took classes or had any kind of interest to make for, uh, you know uh, documentaries or films it was a very interesting intersection of my life that i came across an opportunity um it was cost based so it sort of became a mission and i embraced it and uh, filmed a series of documentaries um, and won several national international awards on those. So that kind of um, a college runaway filmmaker. <laughs> oh, but my heart was somewhere else as a logical mind in my profession. Yes, I am a technologist, but that's a, uh, my left and a right brain both work simultaneously as good as I can make them work. Um, very heart-based uh, approach to dealing with people you touch lives, uh, people you come across, colleagues, friends, neighbors, um, anyone that you interact. Everyone brings a set of unique abilities. And as a leader, as a um, uh, author, we need to we need to understand the humanities shared experiences uh, at least that's my thought process so i learned a lot we we learn from each other and i learned a lot over the years uh, not only just resolving issues in my profession but working with people very intelligent accomplished people that you come across so how everyone comes out there to solve problems and as a leader, we need to create the teams where you bring in that kind of uh, spirit of uh, innovation and helping and solving in uh, uh, issues. Uh, at the end of the day, is all towards the goal or objective, either is uh, profitability of a uh, company or organization or helping humanity. Either way, we have to look at this way that we're solving problem. So anyway, that was a little bit uh, about the work I've done over the years. But uh, I, my heart is, you know, if I had a way of uh, uh, choosing what I want to do, um, I would love to write more books. I would love to travel so uh, and and do different things that I am currently doing. <laughs> So, so, so I'm hearing here you're a creative technologist. Now, would you mind telling us just a little bit what well, I think I left your audio. Oh no! Don't be, don't be go. Can you hear me? I uh, can hear you now. I think I. Oh, okay. Uh, 
the audio, you would have to repeat your question. Uh, I am so sorry. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like you're a bit of a creative technologist, but I am interested, before we get into what you're doing now, what mm -hmm. technologist, what did it? Uh, very interesting question. I, towards the uh, turn of a century, um, where the world was going crazy, Y2K, I was entering tech field. And I came as a system analyst, uh, business analyst with a Fortune 500 company, New York-based company. And uh, then 9-11 um, happens. And then there were a set of regulations. And then I, uh, because of some uh, skill sets that uh, my peers observed and I was very much interested in with attention to detail, I found huge errors in the systems that we were building into this with the new uh, um, regulations, federal regulations that were coming in. So I was put in into sort of uh, really high visible uh, to senior management, but, uh, you know, uh, confidential projects. This was a huge learning opportunity that put me on a path that I have been in a compliance space from anywhere from data privacy, uh, the, the uh, going back in 2003, four, uh, single sign-on took over the world uh, with the new technologies, mainframe slowly uh, going away and new technologies coming in. And then it has been a roller coaster ride of the new technical platforms. And then all different types of uh, compliance, regional compliances. Uh, GDPR is European Union, 32 countries are involved um, into that data uh, privacy of uh, consumer protection, etc. So I found myself in those space of working with C-suite and in all kinds of um, uh, highly visible uh, projects of uh, cyber security, data privacy, et cetera. So um, in, it just, you know, um, I just want to add a little bit here. Um, being in that space, the privilege that I had to work with really experienced, intelligent, uh, colleagues uh, from an, uh, architects to network engineers to all, all uh, I say from tester to CTO and every role in between. Um, the privilege, as I uh, am explaining, that you get to see the whole organizations, how uh, the different departments are working uh, in unison or in silos and from in a bird's eye view you have. So you kind of see how technology helps the business. And that was really a very unique um, experience in my perspective. It doesn't matter what industry you are in today, every household is dependent on technology. Every business of any size is dependent on technology. There would be very few that you could say that we don't use technology, right? So that's how we have the technology in the palms of our hands. And we can reach on the other side of the world in seconds, right? So that's the power of technology. And businesses have thrived. Um, with technology and the technology can also be very expensive. So it really, for small businesses, it creates a quite a big challenge how to invest in the right type of technology. Um, and uh, I think before I go deep into it, I just want to make sure that I'm not, <laughs> did I answer your question? <laughs> I really wanted to just understand what you meant by by, by technologist and, and how you saw yourself. I'm seeing that as uh, you are someone who works with technology, you've got a very broad uh, broad experience in the in the technology technological fields uh, and you try to combine 
all of the knowledge that you have to improve operations overall. That would be my. I think that is correct. Yes, uh, because the role of the technology is to support business. Yes. Right. Regardless of the size of the business. Do you sometimes find, and I'm just going to go a little bit off topic here, do you sometimes find that business feels that their that technology is there to run their business, to drive their business, to tell their business what they should do, rather than them telling technology what it should do for them? Oh, this is an ongoing conflict between technologists and business owners, uh, especially for small businesses. Yes, it's a big challenge. Um, you would hear, I'm sure you have heard and many other uh, tech leaders out there, they have heard it and they would agree. The small businesses often uh, from the management, the take is we are not a technology business. Um, we are business of doing X, which is correct. But we have come to in the 21st century in this third de decade, we are in the artificial intelligence land. We have technology in our homes, in our daily lives, either a Siri or Alexa or Google Maps or whatever you're using, everyone is using technology. So if we want to separate ourselves from it, we can't anymore. Uh, the question becomes the type of technology, how it suits your business. You do not want to um, get oversized technology for a which is a misfit. You do not want to do that. But how do you figure it out? Because the old systems are not supported by many companies. The new systems keep coming in every now and then. There are millions of apps in app stores. The new systems come in. They are built on the newer technology. Uh, so it is a crowded world out there. It makes it very difficult for small business owners to wrap their head around it. Mm. Yeah, it really does. Yes, it, it, it's it's a constant it's a constant discussion with me with my with my my clients and people who want to come and work with me. So I just wanted to go through that because that's it's it's fascinating to me. Uh, but that's not what you're here to talk to us about today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think you 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 are you've actually moved more into a leadership role, haven't you? A leadership and coaching role now. And uh, part of your introduction to me was that you are. Where is it here? You are on your spiritual journey. So why don't we get into the meat of what we're here to discuss today and talk about? that what 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 is it you're doing today and what is the message you want to share with people so i that's a really interesting question that uh, i would love to share with your audience so um as i entered my it career i was uh, first managing processes then in a leadership role managing people and processes the fascinating part to me was that uh, human behavior is such a fascinating thing, really. Like you, uh, um, at the time company I worked with, we would go to a lot of leadership conferences. We have uh, people, uh, you know, companies come in to deliver training. So I would be fascinated to see the interaction people have or don't have. Uh, in these conferences or so. And then um, I was, you know, going through the material, learning, picking up. It was fascinating. And I was personally very much drawn into practical philosophy, not philosophy of a bookish or Eastern or Western or anything, uh, more of a, um, a what helps us in day to day life. Right. So I came across many philosophers. Uh, attending lectures here and there. So learning from them, listening from them, um, what I understood the psychology is a sort of 
lighter version of philosophy, more structured approaches and stuff. It didn't matter to me because I wasn't going psychological route. Being in the philosophy, understanding human behavior, my spiritual journey started with that. Working in New York area, one of the company um, I was with, major global firm, um, we used to celebrate International Day. So I was given a role of committee chair where I had to print what HRVP told us that we had uh, people in our office from 78 nationalities. That was mind boggling. So, um, I, and we printed 80 different flags for our uh, event, for our international events. So, so many colleagues that I would go uh, as a technologist, you know, developing systems at that time, I would be speaking with them. The, what touched me really was that doesn't matter which culture we come from, uh, which uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, category we fit in. The human needs are so similar. Our, we all love our children, families. We all want to have this similar goals and stuff, but we are yet so different. Within the family, we have different mindsets and stuff. That was the time I was writing my first book. It's just like a combination of things, Charlie, that came together that my spiritual journey started. But it was off and on, you know, whenever I had more luxury of time in my uh, life, I would spend more in self-growth, learning and uh, understanding more. But as an empty nester, I have spent a lot more time. I have been working with many organization on global peace initiatives and things. And you come across people from different faith, different uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, most of the people have similar needs. And that's what drew, drew me to uh, understanding, going into the spiritual path more, to help people, understand and help people especially in this uh, more like past COVID, uh, post COVID world, we have learned a lot, you know, a lot of time we have forgotten about COVID sometime it seems, but it gave us so many lessons. It brought communities together. It, brought, it gave people opportunity to see what's more important in our lives. But business has to go on, show must go on. We we continue, we're a very resilient race. And I love that part in human uh, beings. You know, we, we find ways to overcome, but there's still so much need that healing is needed. So I think that's where it drew me so much to, to be in a leader, in a coach role, um, uh, we all have something that we hold and we bury inside. So we need to allow ourselves to heal. Uh, it doesn't matter um, how qualified we are, but we're human beings. So the opportunity, right? The opportunity, um, if it's, you, you will not find it if you wait and put it off. You have to create it. So you mentioned there that you were actually writing your first book as you started on this journey or as you discovered all of this. You obviously went from being a technologist to being, did you go to a, to being a coach to writing your book? Were you writing your book and then what 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 brought you to it? And what, are you, what, are you, what is it you're actually working on today or doing today for people? I wrote book. It was a healing project for me. I went through a very traumatic experience in life. So at that time, I was, like I said, I was drawn to philosophy. And I came across really qualified, really interesting uh, people uh, who I attended their lecture, had conversation. And just it was kind of an urge, I felt, to express. It was like an expression of uh, intellectual thought. Uh, which became very healing process for me. And uh, the coaching part came later. 
I thought of it because I didn't feel that I wanted to stay in technology. I wanted to run away. The more I tried to run away, uh, the more I got pulled in into IT. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I like to this. <laughs> I I kind of created that balance to accept it. Okay, <laughs> you know, uh, I really admire uh, the experiences that I had in a corporate world to learn what I know now. Um, so at the same time, I wanted to be do different things, right? So <laughs> you have to, yeah, yeah, but then. It became, okay, I'll do that when I grow up. Uh, so when you grow up, you don't know when that time comes. So you, I, like I said, when I did my documentary series, that was in an intersection in my life. At that time, uh, it became very apparent to me that you don't put off things. You have to really allow yourself if you really want to do, and it's doable, and you are open to it, I didn't know how to uh, uh, film, but I learned everything about it. I found mentors. Um, something that I write in my first book, and I apply it, and I am amazed how many countless times it has proven true for me. Uh, it's a Japanese proverb, a teacher shall appear when a student is ready. Or could you and say it, that again? Yes, a teacher shall appear when a student is ready. Very true, yes. It has happened to me many times. I cannot explain, I have no words to explain how those coincidences have happened. But there was a sincere desire inside me to do something. And somehow, universe aligned me with someone, something. My question got answered, and I was able to, to proceed or find you know, a path. So I, I think if um, it goes for anything, even if it's a business goal, it doesn't have to be something outside your hobby or anything even a business goal you have to ask yourself is that something for you is that something so I, that I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that back to business because uh most of my audience are business people uh i have a number of uh, predominantly women there are men that listen apparently but predominantly women in small to medium businesses they are probably operating on their own or with a very small team of uh, subcontractors or part-timers how would you apply what you've just said there for them like if they, they're looking at their businesses they're trying to get their businesses up and running sometimes it's tough i mean we've all been there and it, the, lately it's even even harder it, ha, how would you apply what you've just shared there for them i am so pleased you asked me this question that goes back to my uh, book on the women leadership that i wrote after covid uh, lockdown i started on it is uh, if i may talk about it for a, a moment yeah. the the book is the women leadership in the 21st century creating and raising conscious leaders of tomorrow. So, and I'll come back to your question of how to help women. So as women in this 21st century, in third decade, we are contributing almost 50% to the GDPs of our nation. Most of the women are working, and working age women are working. Um, we work hard. We have too many roles to play. We are the givers of life. We are the nurturers of life. We have to play that role as well. At the same time, as mothers, as caregivers, we're doing our businesses, either part-time or something, because of the to take care of children, uh, very young children. It's very hard to work full time and not have anyone else to support you uh, in a family where mom and dad are working. As a young parent, 
the duties of a parenting and working are extremely difficult for the cost of living that we are in this world right now. And those are the realities. We cannot avoid them, right? So, but why it is still so difficult for women to still be able to get funding, be recognized, um, we it's still difficult because of the mindset, um, both for men and women. Um, there is a lot of obstacle women still have regardless of their education. We still have to prove ourselves every step of the way. It becomes extremely difficult. So if a woman is trying to set her own uh, set up her own business, she probably would employ an accountant, would have consultation with attorney, would have other resources, maybe hire part-time people or other workers, depending on their businesses. So as to become an entrepreneur, she will be contributing to employ others or, uh, you know, uh, contribute into the economy, as simple as it is. But for them to get funding, it becomes very hard to grow. So. A lot of women as entrepreneurs. Sorry, can I just ask you a question there? You've said that a couple of times where as a woman, it's very difficult for us to get support and get get funding and such. What do you mean by that? So if you are a women uh, entrepreneur and you go out for um, working capital uh, to grow your business, you need um, you could be equally qualified with your counterpart uh, who is going to uh, a bank or any lending organization. Um, it's very difficult for women to get those types of uh, loans approved. Why? This is very common in US. It's very common. And um, I do not have an answer why. They are. I, I, I'm just more. Cons I'm just more interested. Is 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 it because women don't present themselves in a way of saying yes, I deserve this, and I I I I'm presenting to say I am a I'm I'm serious about this. I want to do this because they they feel that they don't deserve it, or is it something else that that that, that is happening? Is so it because I, they don't have the education? Sorry, I'm just I'm just asking some questions here. Is it because they don't have the education on how to present for that those those sorts of funds, and that gets them knocked back? Whereas um, a male may present slightly more confidently, uh, or be able to put the numbers down in the way that the numbers need to be presented, whereas women are more uh, emotional about it. Are we more esoteric about how we do things? So the answers that I, when I speak to other people, experts um, that I get and I gather, um, is a combination of things. Women are not as assertive sometimes asking for funding, plus um, there is just a general mindset. Uh, mostly the lenders would see a uh, business history. So if you're starting out something, you don't have one. You're creating one. So right. it limits your growth. It limits your growth. So you right. would grow, but at a slower pace. Right. Correct, but that, that's not that doesn't. But that doesn't just apply to women. That then that's men and women who who enter into that market because they don't have that business. Yes, but I have heard uh, even from some consultants that you know they would share uh, because sometimes I would ask uh, on on um, open conversations and a networking, and it's just like okay, what else is needed? What else is needed? Sometimes it's just the. Uh, as, um, I, I don't want to say something as being biased against women. It's just that they don't feel that women uh, would continue doing this business or this is their hobby sort of thing. And lenders feel like, okay, they don't want to invest in a hobby. It's not the case for all the time. But majority of the women who are starting as a small businesses, 
it becomes really difficult for them to grow at a pace, regardless of the dedication they may have. They're juggling so many roles, um, young families and uh, as caregivers to parents and stuff. So there is, there is a lot that they need to. So of course, uh, that's where I uh, come and say, you have to put something on a back burner um, to in order to go in one direction. So um, when you are doing that, and you have to ask yourself very honest and brutal questions, is this something for you? Thank are you, you ready? That, 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 is, that actually resonates really, really heavily. And that, that actually hits part of my younger journey was I tried to be everything to everyone. I tried to do everything. And I had to come to the realization, I had to make a decision. I could do one thing well, or I could do two things well, uh, and everything else would have to go by the way for a bit, or I could go and focus on the other thing that I wanted to do. Yes. That makes so, far more sense to me. Yes. So you have to create a a sensible plan that works for you. Uh, that, okay, you may want to come back a few years later to something, you know, because as a, a young parents, um, those rearing uh, age uh, the, uh, until adolescence, those are the forming years and you want to give your best. You want to enjoy their childhood as well. The time goes by so quickly, right? So sometimes we have to put our ambition on the back burner. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I think your ambition gets um, channeled into something different and that channeling is in raising our children and in being there to be the caregiver. And it's something I regret is not, not being able to have done that when I was younger. I was too busy working, too busy trying to be successful, too busy trying to do all the other things. And my kids grew up. And, and yeah. I, I look back and I miss those years, it, whereas yeah. I think if I had taken a slightly different path and spent more time at home, taken a part-time job, earned less money, spent less money, lived slightly less higher on the hog and spent it with my children, I think it would be a very different experience and a much more fulfilling experience for me. Yes, I agree. I agree. And and that is the struggle a lot of the young entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs see that. They struggle with because the ambition is equally important and then having a family because then it's a it's very tough balance. So you have to figure it out uh, what takes higher priority. Like you said, you know, maybe have more simpler lifestyle and or part-time job. And that's where, you know, when I try to put pieces together, then I feel sometimes maybe that is still the reason as lenders see, okay, women are not as serious. They might be, it just could be in a hobby, not a business, right? So this that's the kind of sense I get. We never know the real reasons, right? Nobody would, lenders would not tell you. Uh, because that's how we feel about you. They said, okay, approved or rejected, right? Um, and yeah. there's a lot of, uh, then the resentment sometimes women would have that I tried, I tried and, you know. So, and, and uh, looking back many years, I had a lot of different things in my head that I could do. But as my first book uh, that I did, uh, I wrote, I would apply those uh, strategies of uh, the Mastering Life uh, book. Um, and the part of it was every six months, I started with doing those exercises every three months, I'd come back. Then I, a year later, every six months, it changed. It changed my growth so much asking those questions, the introspection and self-evaluation uh, uh, type of uh, conversation that I would have. So when you look back uh, 10 years later, you look back, some of those things you get attracted to, but they were not really um, important. 
they felt attractive at time yes yes like we uh, we grow with the age as well with experience as well so 20 years ago um a dreams you had at that time you wanted to have it so bad but when you look back it has no meaning anymore no that's correct right we grow we change we we... circumstances change I, I uh, talk about COVID, I could go on and on uh, for those that so many stories you hear from people. Um, the the resilience and uh, the strength and how it changed people's perspective about life and things in general and how things, it's so uh, things change. So let's let's go back now to the question that I asked about women business owners and how they can be applying <laughs> these things, <laughs> or to, like, to business owners in general. Um, business owners, what can they do to grow their business? How 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 can the things that you're discussing here and you discussed earlier be applied in a business sense for 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 a new business owner? I would say if um, anyone say part time, if they are doing part time because it's the need, the family need that they have is a work life balance. Absolutely fine, because you, the time will come because you would uh, learn uh, important lessons that you uh, it's very hard for someone to say. This is what you need to look for because you as a business owner know yourself what is working, what's not working. If things are not working, you find out. Then you go to an expert and ask, what can I do things differently, right? So that's it. That's something that I would like to kind of upfront um, say that. Uh, second is the technology. Technology has grown so much. There are a lot of different platforms. Some are uh, inexpensive to use. If you could delegate some of work processes that you have uh, with these technologies uh, that you can at a small cost uh, utilize uh, to assist you, that's another thing that we have this privilege. 20 years ago, small business owner did not have. Right. So utilize that. But um, there's so many products out there. So understand what fits best. Third item I would like to say is that if you need funding to grow, if there are uh, sources that would assist you through family circles or some small lending organizations, there are some uh, um, economic development uh, sort of uh, organizations uh, here in US, we have statewide and federal that uh, small business loans uh, are available. So if you have something, have a good business plan. This sure. is the this is the most important document anywhere that you will go for funding bank or any lending institution they would want to see your business plan uh you can't just go on the internet download a template and put it together you have to have put your heart in that first you have to understand every component of that business plan what they're asking it's just not a verbiage once you become confident and you speak with that confident and then other person sees this is not hobby you're serious the conversation changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that comes back to some of my questions earlier about, is it because we don't present in a way that appears to be serious? Yes. Because it's like, oh, well, I'm going to give this a try. Well, if you're going to give it a try, I'm not really <laughs> that interested in trying to help you because it's a risk. It's a big risk. Oh, mm -hmm. you've got a business plan and you can talk to that business plan and you can tell me what your thoughts are and you can actually explain it. That changes everything. It does. Because if you have gone through that writing, not just putting the content into it, 
writing is this is what you mean that means you are serious yeah. it really yeah. does because i'm also gonna um do, do you also find that it changes your mindset as well about what you're doing because you you're now developing more knowledge more insight into the business you're trying to build yes yes because and i had asked this question to a um um very established uh, businessman uh, recently has marketing changed after covid uh, for what for certain COVID. and um he goes yes the marketing messaging uh, changes depending on the platform we are on uh, i'm not a tiktok user but i hear from people that there is uh, tiktok has a lot of uh, uh, sort of um, the younger or the specific type of um, influencer for different type of products and the need. I miss. So, yeah. <laughs> so if we look at five years ago, um, at that time, no one would have thought to use such type of social media for marketing. But it has become an important tool. I wouldn't say critical, but it's one of the important tools uh, out there, right? So the model it depends on your type of product and understanding your competition and a healthy competition, being in a healthy competition. So if your market is local, um, so think of what are the uh, the uh, venues there they would locally attract but if you are regional based or then you have more competition in a mm -hmm. region be open to that accept that is going to be there women are sensitive uh sometimes it just feels that uh, we feel uh being attacked or being uh targeted or something and not bring your then you have to develop that kind of the stamina of being an entrepreneur and set aside other things is that competition is a healthy competition. How do you promote yourself and stand out? It's very difficult uh, for everybody, not just for women, it's for everybody. But that's the world we are living in right now with uh, having the social media as our marketing platforms. Excellent. Awesome. Look, thank you so much. And that, that, that really helps immensely. So I think one of the things that you said there that my audience can take from it is to be, to be considered serious, to make things a little more easier for yourselves is have a business plan, get it together, understand what is driving you to build your business and then put that into your business plan because that's then going to come through to anyone else who reads it give me a business plan i will be happy to read it come to me and tell me that oh i'm not thinking of doing this i'm thinking of doing that i'm like well when you know what you're going to do come back and talk to me <laughs> i don't want to know what you're thinking i want to know what you're going to be doing yes. because yes. that's the important thing now rita you've mentioned a couple of times you've written several books would you like to tell me about your books Oh, definitely. I love to talk about. So um, the Mastering Life came around the turn of the century. Um, and that was in a very really critical time in my life. Well, like I said, where I started, um, it was kind of a uh, um, healing expression, so to speak, uh, in a very positive way. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot in that process. It was really a growth process all together professionally by chance at the time I was growing in my professional role um, and spiritually personally I I learned a lot uh, to to have that type of inner strength and understanding and see and still be um, able to not only um, for my personal benefit but people that i come across you know how to touch their lives uh, when i wrote mastering life i had a publisher a, a um uh, the publisher of a magazine that i spoke with and she had called me 
from my airport. She said, I read your book and I'm going to give it to my niece and she's going through some very really difficult time. So, well, anyway, she was at the airport at the time. And later on in a conversation, I wanted to ask you what made you, right, uh, give it to someone else. So uh, my thought process at that time was, as an author, when we write something, we don't know who it would touch. Right? That's so correct. that was, we don't know. And uh, then um, during COVID lockdown, I always wanted to like being in tech space and I saw women um, uh, in tech side of it and others. So being in a corporate environment, I always thought that I would write something about women leadership and stuff. Uh, but uh, during this lockdown period, um, I saw really high ranking women I was connected with uh, around the world and we would talk and mostly women took the toll in a really uh, high leadership positions, men did too. But in a couple of years, it was easier for men to get back, really qualified at the same leadership level uh, than women. And then we'll have conversation. And I, I saw uh, many of my first connections um, took early retirements. You know, wonderful experience. And it dawned to me when they go into uh, from these outstanding experience of decades, and when they go to retirement just like that, um, this knowledge is wasted. And I wanted to tap into that knowledge. So that became my title, uh, Women Leadership in 21st Century, uh, Creating and Raising the Conscious Leaders of Tomorrow. Because I want those women as uh, givers of life and nurturers, we have the capacity to bring everyone to the table the empathy and everything, the conversations. So I wanted uh, to create a messaging and call to action for women of baby boomer generation to collaborate with men and pass the baton for a younger generation who is growing up with devices. They are inheriting the challenges that we have not seen yet. They are very new challenges than last century. So the lot of the golden rules of leadership that worked very well in the past, not are going to fit for these young people because they are inheriting or dealing with very unique issues and challenges in a digital, digital world, in a global village. And uh, it's very different. So they need different type of strategies. They need mentorship. And leaving young people out there uh, just on their own to navigate life, and they will be our leaders of tomorrow, we have to play a role. And I want my call to women uh, leaders is that you don't need a corporate or a political title, an elected official's title to be a leader. You could be a leader in your community or someone. Bring everyone together and pass the baton to raise young. When young families are struggling too much, uh, to to and they don't have the time uh, to spend with their uh, kids or grand uh, no as a grandchildren, you could provide that type of mentorship. So there is so much that we can do, and that's the kind of you know a very high level theme. But I talk about the power and persuasion, women still are struggling they come in their own way I, I talk about so much about the tools technologies in the fourth industrial uh, revolution the digital world that we are in the shared vision the sustainable goals how we can align the leadership strategies with sdgs that helps the humanity the shared humanity uh, and uh, shared vision so it's a lot more than just uh, having, uh, you know, um, conversation to bring everyone to the table. So that's where that became. And my next one, I am hoping to publish it by the end of the year. But uh, let's see, Magic and Mindfulness. And that book is kind of 
very much centered towards, I would say it definitely has the spirituality element in it, as we as human beings, uh, as a re resilience race we have, but we live in a chaotic world. How do we apply uh, the strategies that ancient cultures have built for calmness in our chaotic world? How do we apply in our daily lives? So that's sort of partially workbook, and um, but it deals with um, having that that uh, uh, learning and understanding of the self growth and applying it. It may not be day one or in a week or so, but when you start understanding very simple principles, simple things that they can be uh, incorporated in our daily lives, your children, people around you pick up very quickly. It creates an uh, extremely positive um, atmosphere. So those are the things that I think where I, when I say I am on my spiritual journey, so my goals had been to help uh, people that I touch lives. That sounds fantastic and those books sound great. I will make sure I have links in the show notes for people. Uh, we are coming towards the end of our time. Out of everything we've spoken about today, what is the one thing you would like our audience to take away with them? I would say, as you had mentioned, most of your audiences are women entrepreneurs. So I would love to say and share that never give up on your dreams. It might seem difficult at the moment, but if you really have a dream, I really want it to, don't feel that you have to prove it to someone. If it's your dream and you want to do it, something you want to achieve, go for it. You'll find the strength, not to impress others, but it, you have to be very clear in your heart. It is something that you have to make sure that that's your desire, that you is so strong um, desire for you uh, to bring into this world and go for it. Sounds fantastic. Now, how can people find you, Ritu? How, if they if they want to connect with you, uh, have a chat, what it, whatever it is. Uh, so we have all our social media accounts. People can go there. People can come to our site and womenleadershipbook at gmail.com. That's another book people can reach out to us. Uh, so we can provide all the links uh, to connect it, to get connected with us. And um, uh, off and on, we do have uh, complimentary webinars. So we talk about different types of either it be mindfulness or women leadership or leadership in general. And when I say, I want to clear something, when I say women leadership, it's not limited to women. If you are a male and you want to support your daughter, your niece, your wife, or sister, or someone, and you want to understand that how else I can support them, how else I can be a mentor. My dad was a mentor to me. Um, so it, it, that doesn't mean that we are shutting men out the door uh, talking about women leadership. We want men to be part of us, uh, supporting us. So please do join us. <laughs> That's a great message. Look, thank you so much for being with us. I have enjoyed our time together. Uh, guys, please remember to, let me see if I get this right, like our video, subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell so that you find out when I set up more content. I do have my daily episodes that go out. They are the daily dose of business inspiration. They're designed to help you start your day in a meaningful and inspirational way to keep your business running and successful and you in the right frame of mind. If you are watching this anywhere where you can leave a review, please do. It does help and I would appreciate it a lot. And I do respond to it. I do take all that feedback and try to improve what I'm doing. 
Ritu, thank you so much for your time today. It has been very enjoyable and um, I will have all of your contact details and such in our show notes. Guys, have a great week and I will see you all next week. Thank you.